Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky's Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky's Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your host, Sean. On this episode, we have another heartbreaking Bears loss. The Bulls in a devastating slide. And the Blackhawks finally playing well. All this and more on this episode of Bill Swirsky's Sports Talk Chicago. But first, we'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. So... And located just 90 minutes from the city limits in Rockford, Illinois, you get to see the Blackhawks stars of tomorrow today, like Ryan Hartman, Marco Dano, Tanner Caro. I'll see all of them for the low, low starting price of $7. That's affordable family fun. You get to take your kids and not break the bank. Like I said, 90 minutes from the city limits and... You can go see them play the day after Christmas. We're all off, probably. This Saturday, December 26th at 7 p.m. against the Milwaukee Admirals. So check it out, icehogs.com. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Oh, where to begin, where to begin, where to begin. We've got so much badness in Chicago sports right now and so much goodness. There's no intermediate. It's bad or good. I'm going to start because I feel like you all want to talk Bears. We want to talk about our Chicago Bears. We're just desperately upset. And and I want to talk a little bit about this game against the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, looking at the schedule, this is the game of the last three I thought that they were going to lose. I f- felt like they could beat the uh, the Tampa Bay Bucks. And they could beat the Detroit Lions, even though they lost them once. But Minnesota, I just didn't think they were going to beat. And not only did they not beat them, they got their asses handed to them up and down. And that's, it's just frustrating. It, I mean, this team as a whole, they, they, you can tell this is the intersection of too many guys are hurt not enough talent, not enough speed, and guys giving up. That's where they all intersect is at this game. And it, it just really showed. Uh, I mean, it started off with a bang. Is You had Thompson with a great kickoff return to start the game. And then from the first play from scrimmage, you have uh, Matt Forte nearly taking it to the red zone. But then that's where all goes downhill. Is That comes back with a Hronis Grasso holding penalty. And it's all downhill from there. Uh, I I don't even know where to begin here. It, I mean, I guess, you know, we, we start on offense because that's where the Bears started. And the, the Bears, you know, follow through on that. After that opening kickoff, they follow through with what's plagued them, plagued their offense all season long. It's shooting themselves in the foot. You know, the holding on Grasso negated the 20-yard uh, Matt Forte run, uh, followed it up by a, a first down run on first and 20 for no gain, then a coverage sack. And it's just it's just miscues and, and penalties that just set them back. If you look at this offense when they were really firing on all cylinders and it looked like we were able to do something, it's... What's happening is that the Bears are moving the ball and getting positive yards on first and second down and setting up third manageable, third and short situations. Take the pressure off Jay Cutler, keep Jay Cutler upright, and and open some holes for the running game. That's that was the formula. And and whenever the play would break down, 
Jay Cutler, he at least bought Jay Cutler enough time and space to to be able to roll out and then manufacture a playground type play, uh, sending Alshon deep and, and throwing it up for him. It, that's the types of things that have worked for the Bears in these last few weeks. None of that has been there. They've they've looked like a team that's out of sync, out of gas, and out of care. Uh, I mean, so let's let's start on offense. Um, the first quarter, they had ten yards. Ten yards in the first quarter. That that, that can't be a thing. They can't be a thing if you want to play in the NFL. Uh, that's just that's just embarrassing. Um, I mean, the running backs looked halfway decent. Uh, I mean, Matt Forte missed a couple of blocks. There was one on the the second drive where he missed uh, the blitzing Jad Greenway that led to a Cutler sack. That wasn't that great. But other than that, the the running backs ran hard. And, you know, they weren't always picking up yards, but at least they were running hard. Uh, you know, Langford continued to look good. I, I'm really excited to see what he's going to do next year with hopefully a little bit of a revamp offensive line and and maybe, you know, a little bit heavier of the workload. Uh, the wide receivers, they did they even show up today? I didn't see much. I mean, Mariani has continued to be a decent slot receiver when he's given the opportunity, but... Uh, putting putting a royal on the outside didn't really show me anything, and Alshon just he just is not healthy. He's not healthy. I don't know if it's hamstring or if it's his ankle or if it's his calf or if it's whatever it is. Whatever's injured now, it, he's not playing. It's not that he's not playing well. He's just not playing healthy, and a non-healthy Alshon Jeffrey, he's not getting open. These wide receivers, this whole game, were not getting open. Uh, you know, Jay Cutler was either under fire all day long because the offensive line wasn't blocking, or he's under fire because there's coverage sacks because the, the wide receivers aren't getting open. It really put him in a predicament, and that, that was crappy. So the wide receivers just, what I thought was going to be an exceptional high point going into the season turn out to be a complete low point uh, between devastating injuries to Alshon Jeffrey, uh, Kevin White, uh, Eddie Royal, uh, and now Marquise Wilson. I mean, you're on, you're not just on third string, you're on fourth, fifth string. There's a, you know, there's an old saying in football is next man up. Basically what that means is that the next guy has to be ready at all times because if the guy ahead of him gets hurt, then he's got to come in and play. And they can't stop the, the system that they're running because he's the backup. The other team's not going to say, well, you know, they've got their backup in. Let's give them a break. No, you have to go in there and play the game. But honestly, that, that saying really only goes for second string. When you're on your third, fourth, and fifth, sixth string guys, at some point there's a drop off, and you're not going to be able to just say next man up. I mean, you could say it all you want, and you could try to believe it all you want, but it's just not true. You have to start. You have to start playing a different style of offense if you have no wide receivers. Offensive line. <sighs> you know, I, I sang their praises up and down a few weeks ago. And all season long, I've been I've said that they have been a pretty good line, and I wouldn't be sad if this line came back. And then it just one day, it's all started to fall apart. Uh, I mean, up to this point, you know, the 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 two guards have been more than adequate, and in fact, pretty good. And Patrick Omame and and Matt Slauson, they they've played really well. I mean, they're. Their grades and pro football focus have been good. They've just, the eyeball tests have looked good. They, they've been good. I mean, you know, some penalties here and there, but, uh, you know, they, they're definitely, definitely doing their job. Uh, Charles Leno, who was a guy that I thought they were going to cut because he just couldn't find his place in this. Oh, I'm an old man. I'm yawning. 
Charles Leno trying to find his place in the NFL, and he finds it as left tackle and has played pretty well. And then you move your arguably your best player or your best offensive line player to the right tackle spot in Kyle Long. And you know, due to an injury to, to Will Montgomery, you 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 force your your th- rookie third round pick, Cronus Grassu, and put him in at center. And you know, Cronus Grassu has had his ups and downs this season, which is pretty common for a rookie center. And uh, and the rest of the line has looked pretty good. Uh, after, besides the first game, Kyle Long has just really stepped up and, and looked good at right tackle. And then the last couple weeks, you saw some chinks in the armor for him. And Ronis Grasso is, the flaws he has are really starting to become more pronounced. And then you have penalties on the other three. It's really becoming uh, an issue. Is, I mean, Hronis Grasso, if he's not holding, he's getting completely blown up at the line of scrimmage by big, powerful bull rushers or speed guys. And he just he just doesn't look good out there. I mean, I still have faith because scouting him out of, out of Oregon, he was a really talented guy. I really liked him coming out of Oregon. Uh... If you listen to Olin Krutz, who has, you know, earned his stripes as a, a center in the NFL, has, you know, praise for him, and and said that the, a lot of the kinks that he has in his game will be worked out because it just takes time. Uh, the thing about center is that it's a really complicated position to play. It's not that you just snap the ball and then block the guy in front of you. You're making the calls from for the offensive line. You're identifying who's got who as far as blocking schemes. Uh, you're identifying blitzers. Uh, you're you're trying to identify what they're going to be doing as a pass rushing stance and figure out who to block. You add that on top of you have to be able to snap the ball every time. It's snapping the ball. You're like, oh, it's not that hard, but you have to be perfect. Any any miscues and the media and the coaches and the fans are eating you alive. One bad snap in a whole game of snaps. One bad snap and they are all on you. It's uh, and trying to do so when you're just after you're identifying blitzers and, and who's got who and making the offensive line play calls, and and then you have to block a 400 pound man who runs like a gazelle. I, it's it takes time. I'm and I'm more than willing to give it to him. It just takes time, and if he's going to have his growing pains in the five and eleven year, or whatever the Bears finish, seven and, and nine, whatever it is, I'm okay with that. Makes him come back next year and be better. But the one that's scaring me is uh, Kyle Long. These last few weeks, he just hasn't looked the same. I mean, the first week he was. A right guard for all of eight minutes and had to go in and, and play against Julius Peppers. And Peppers got the best of him. But a couple weeks later, when they played Green Bay at Green Bay, is he ate Julius Peppers up. And it just you know, it was it was a it was a work of beauty. And you know, playing against some of the better defensive ends in the league, and he held his own. And then suddenly, these last three weeks, it's just, I don't know what it is. He's hes getting beat by by guys that are, you know, using swim moves. He's getting beat on bull rushes. He's getting beat on speed rushes. And, and it's its really affecting Jay Cutler. It's not just that the, the play is getting blown up. It's to the point where Jay Cutler is now starting to see, you know, Foots, they're here footsteps and see ghosts. I, I mean, because these guys are are basically beating beating Kyle Long like he's a turnstile out there. It's like he's Jamarcus Webb Part Two. And that's and that's a little bit scary because Kyle Long has been good most of the year at right tackle, and, and now you're starting to see the Jamarcus Webb traits, and it's it's bad because he's got the strength, he's got the attitude. 
he works hard and he's got the footwork and the athleticism. I, so I can't put my finger on, on what it is that's going on with him and why this is happening. But all day long, he's getting Cutler, he's getting beat, and his man is basically coming free right at Cutler. And that's really affecting Jay Cutler. Uh, on one of the early drives in the, uh, the second quarter, for example, uh, Kyle Long got confused on a stunt. So they, they ran a stunt. So the man that he thought he was blocking went inside, and Patrick Omame ended up taking him. And then the defensive tackle looped around and went right around Kyle Long. And Kyle Long just stood there looking confused, and and his man you know came in free and got to, got to Cutler. Uh, then there was the, you know, when Brian Robinson just beat him around the corner and and went free and, and sacked Cutler and caused the forced fumble. Uh, those are those are bad plays. Those aren't just, oh, I I had one moment in this game or mental lapse or this is this is consistent all game long for three games. Uh, I heard I heard. You know, some radio talk show hosts talk about how they felt like he's he's got to tell or he's giving something away. He's tipping, quote, tipping his pitches when when he's uh he's at the line. And I, I mean, that's a possibility, but I don't know if I, I believe that because if if somebody's watching that much game film that they're able to see identify, you know, if his hands if he's leaning forward and and when you Let's back up a second. Is is when you're an offensive lineman and you're a three point stance. If when you put your fingers down, if you're leaning forward like you're putting your weight on there, like you're going to fire out for a, a run block, is you're going to see you're going to see the pressure on the fingertips. When you have your weight on your heels and you're just using the fingers as your balance, and you're going to you're going to backpedal and retreat into a into a pass blocking stance is you're you're not going to get the same finger looks, and I can't imagine that there's offensive line coaches that have that that in depth detailed f uh, film of guys' fingertips that they're able to see that. Uh, I just think it's a fatigue factor for Kyle Long, a little bit of frustration, a little bit of lack of confidence, and, and that's a big part in. I mean, I think that's way more likely than than somebody is is caught this, you know, figured out Kyle Long. I mean, Kyle Long has been a guard for a long time, and the beauty about playing guard is you can mask a lot of things. If if a speed guy beats you, you're you're not going to do too much damage as a guard. It's more of a, you know, you're going to get exposed if you get beat with strength, and that wasn't really happening with Kyle Long. Um, but at right tackle is if a guy beats him with speed, it's noticeable. And, you know, you don't have help on both sides. You're, you're kind of on an island a little bit. And I think confidence plays a much bigger part. And he has a little bit of shaken confidence. And that, that seems more logical because you physically and talent-wise, you know what you have. You've seen it. You witnessed it with your own eyes. You saw the way he could play guard. You know, making two consecutive Pro Bowls, so you know he can play offensive line in the NFL. And after that first week, he is he played exceptionally well. You know, from after that first week and up until about the 49ers game, is he played exceptionally well at right tackle. And then it went downhill from there. So you can't tell me he forgot how to play. I, I'm chalking it up to frustration and lack of confidence. Is you know, once a guy beats you a couple of times. And sometimes you just he has your number. And if he beats you a couple times, then you start questioning your stuff, you overthink things, and then that's that's when you're not playing well, is when you're not not just reacting. Uh, so offensive line is is was a real problem in this game because they weren't able to establish the run. The run game was just it was it was pretty bad. I mean they weren't able to consistently get any sort of of sustained running they weren't getting any sort of good yardage on first and second downs and way too many negative and, and no yard plays uh, and as far as pass off or pass blocking is that was even worse 
you just had Jay Cutler under fire all game long. And then speaking of Jay Cutler is up until a certain point when I was kind of taking my notes for the game, I I was like, I'm going to give him an incomplete grade because his wide receivers aren't getting open. Alshon is clearly not playing healthy. Uh, they just don't look right. So nobody's getting open. The offensive line is not open any holes for the running game. And Jay Cutler's under fire. And, you know, he's he's really, there's nothing he can do. And if, if your guys aren't open and you're under fire, there's, unless you're Cam Newton, who can just take off and run with it every time, you know, there's really nothing you can do. And then that's when he started forcing balls. That's when he just stopped rolling out and, and trying to run, you know, at least run to the outside and try to set something up. Uh, he wasn't throwing the ball away, you know, out of bounds when, when he did get out of the pocket. And and then he throws an inter- you know, the interception to the defensive lineman. And that's, that's a big no-no. Uh, I mean, he threw it straight to the defensive lineman. And that was clearly a product of he, he had... Like the the offensive line playing so poorly, just ruined his internal clock and ruined his sense of of somebody coming up and in, in you know as a quarterback you have to have this sixth sense of when somebody's coming up on you, so you can step up in the pocket or roll out or whatever the case may be is to use your feet. Uh, all the top quarterbacks have good. It's called pocket pocket presence and pocket awareness. And Jay Cutler for the most part, has had a good pocket presence and pocket awareness this year. In this game, I don't know if it's he had PTSD from back in the Mike Martz days when he'd have to do seven-step drops and was just getting murdered. Uh, you know, I don't know if he was having flashbacks to that or, or what, but it just his pocket awareness just, just went right down the toilet and... And he was clearly hearing footsteps and just threw a ball that was bad. Uh, so I, I had to move my incomplete grade to to a bad mark for, for Jay Cutler. And, and it sucks to say because as a whole, this whole season, I thought Jay Cutler has done really well. And I would have loved to have seen what he could have done with healthy wide receivers, healthy tight end core, and offensive line playing like they did in the middle of the season. Because that's when you give Jay Cutler all those tools, and with an offensive coordinator who he still believes in, that's when you get the best out of Jay Cutler. And I guess that's about it for that. Uh, I want to move over to the defense a little bit. Is um, I mean, watching, you know, listening to people talk about the game is. They keep saying, well, at least Adrian Peterson didn't beat the Bears. I mean, granted, he didn't beat the Bears. And if you look at his numbers, he didn't he didn't put up exceptional numbers. But if you watched prior to when he got hurt, is Adrian Peterson was running pretty consistent on the Bears, picking up, you know, several yards and positive yards on every clip for the most part. And you had you ended up having safeties coming up and trying to tackle Adrian Peterson. You don't want. I mean, there's no defensive system that's on a good team where you want your safeties coming up and making all the stops on a running back. It's just they're just not what you want. You you don't want that at all. You want your. I mean, if you need to, you have a safety step up and be an eighth man in the box, but you don't want you don't want the safety making all those plays. I always learned that the defensive line should uh, occupy all of the offensive line and the linebackers fill the gaps and make the tackles and get the glory. And that's, and for the most part, that's a lot of uh, the NFL is a lot of NFL believes that I fully believe though, that the def- you really want your defensive linemen to get as many of the tackles on a running back as possible. It's, uh, I look at it like levels is first level is defensive line, second level is uh, the linebackers, and the third level is your defensive backs. And you want the lowest line to get the most number of tackles on your running back, and that's your defensive line. If 
your defensive tackle is making every tackle on the on the running back, odds are he's not that running back's not picking up very many yards in this game. But when your safety is making all these tackles on the, on the running back, you have to really consider is is what's your scheme doing because that means he's probably tackling him at least five yards down the field from the line of scrimmage. And if you're picking up five yards a clip and you can't stop a running back from, from doing that, then you're, you're in trouble. It's going to be a long day. So, yeah, Adrian Peterson didn't put up these crazy numbers and he didn't have any huge runs, but he consistently ran well and he was putting up positive yards and it forced the Bears to have to to have to do something to stop Adrian Peterson and it totally opened up room for Teddy Bridgewater to to look like Tom Brady and I I refuse to to acknowledge that Teddy Bridgewater is that good because up to this game he had nine passing touchdowns and he threw for four during that game. He threw for half of the number of touchdowns he had in the season in one game against the Bears. And he had another one rushing. So that's what happens is when you have a team that just is giving up, you have a team that just decimated with injuries, uh, you have a team that's lacking talent, and you gear up to stop the run with a suspect defensive backfield and lack of team speed. It doesn't take a genius to figure out what's going to happen. Um, you know, Kyle Rudolph. They, I mean, if they didn't get exposed last week with uh, with the tight end from from the Redskins just completely burning them, is this week Kyle Rudolph? Uh, he's he's out there running with, and Jonathan Anderson is just not fast enough to keep up with him, and. Uh, and just really points to the Bears' lack of defensive speed, team speed as a whole. Uh, you have Prasinski missing another tackle on a third down because he's a tackle-missing machine. And the fact that you have him as a starting safety is is something that's just really concerning. Uh, you know, This is another case of a game where the Bears' defense lets the other team march right down the field on the opening drive and, and score. That's That's been their hallmark for the last several weeks, and it's not one that you can have if you're going to be winning. You've got you've to make them earn those points. If you're starting every game down 7 nothing, it's it's not a recipe for success. Uh, you know, looking back on that touchdown that, to Diggs in the end zone is – I mean, I can't, I can't be mad at, at Porter on that one because it was really just a perfect throw. Is Porter had pretty good coverage on him, and put his arms up to try to deflect it, and that ball just kind of looped right over the top of Porter, right into Diggs' hands, and it was a perfect throw. Like, I, you know, you, you can't, you got, you can't take that away from Teddy Bridgewater. As much as I don't think he's the next coming, like a lot of people do, is he did make a really good throw in there. Then there was the. Uh, uh, there was another play where Mike Wallace was covered short by the linebackers and over the top by Prasinski. And it was just absolutely awful coverage is, you know, you, you think, you think by bracketing a guy with, uh, somebody underneath and somebody over the top that you're going to be able to take that guy away. But the linebackers just gave so much cushion and Prasinski is just, he's terrible. Uh, and it just led to big gains and easy throws. So I want to I want to talk a little bit about the defensive linemen. Is you know there was so many offsides and uh, lined up in the neutral zone penalties on Houston and Sutton. It just that's just you already have a porous defense and you're already having difficulty stopping the other team from scoring. Is why are you giving them free plays and free yards? You can't do that. Uh, there was another play where the Bears' defense read a screen and and read it perfectly. And you had Timu, who had just came off the practice squad and is playing inside linebacker, and he just wasn't fast enough to get over there, and he ended up trying to make a diving tackle. 
and that led to a huge, huge pickup for the Vikings when it should have been a busted play and a, either you know no, no gain or a loss of yards. You know, just the Bears don't have a lot of talent, and their 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 team speed is just lacking. Uh, you know, Willie Young stepped up. And he's starting to figure out how to play in this system, and he had a sack in his fifth straight game. Your cornerbacks, uh, you know, there was a play where I'm stealing a term from the NBA, but Fuller got posterized by Adrian Peterson. Uh, Adrian Peterson was coming out to the flat with the, carrying the ball, and Kyle Fuller was forced to slow down and get into a tackling stance because otherwise Adrian Peterson can make you look foolish and that really that really enters the mind of a guy. So Adrian Peterson forced Kyle Fuller to to stop it and get into a tackle stance and then Peterson just stiff armed him and ran right around him. And I can't really be mad at Fuller for that because there's you know, there's not too many people in the league that Adrian Peterson can't do that to. But it just it just sticks out like a sore thumb when it happens to the Bears. Uh, you know, for the third Vikings touchdown, you had Diggs was coming across on a crossing route. And so he's coming across the flat, going towards the, uh, the right, the right sideline and the outside wide receiver crossed inside. And what happens is your, your cornerbacks are supposed to make a switch there. And Porter made his switch and went over and took the, the outside wide receiver that was coming in, and Alan Ball was supposed to to cover Diggs as he went out, and uh, at first Alan Ball kept going and, and tried to cover the man that he was originally on and didn't pick up on the switch, and then when he saw that Diggs got open, he he tried to stop and reroute and, and do a complete 180, and it just you know Diggs was too fast and. Uh, Teddy Bridgewater was too accurate on the throw and and sets up a you know third touchdown for the Vikings. Uh, it was you know not not a good game for the cornerbacks for the Bears on on any part. Uh, and the safeties, Adrian Amos came up and tried to make some big hits, but Prasinski's terrible. I mean, it just I feel like every week I'm saying the same things over and over and and. You know, the Bears who are the who we thought they were is uh as the old saying goes, um it just they, they are who we thought they were. And it's a team that just is lacking talent and is just sorta of giving up. You know, there's only so much coaching you can do is when winning cures a lot of ails and when you're losing it really highlights a lot of things. Uh and then just sort of some of the lucks and in, luck and intangibles is you know, the ball luck was not in the Bears' favor this game. It was in the first quarter, you had Pernell McPhee tip the pass, and it went up. And although there was a bunch of Bears defenders that were around the ball, the ball fell to the ground because nobody saw it. Nobody saw where it went. And that could have been a nice pick. Uh, you have in the second quarter, Blair Walsh has a bad kick. It hits the upright and, and bounces in. That's uh, you know that's that's just luck. It's <laughs> sometimes that's football. Um, you know, so all in all, the Bears the Bears got dominated in this game on the offense and on defense. It's you know, there's only so much coaching you can do on this team. You have to you have to have the players that are willing to play and and have the talent to do so. Um, it's really started to have me question what you have going forward. And you know, I, I heard a few quote experts saying that they don't think the Bears are any better off than they were last year at this time. And I think that's that's silly. I think that's a silly statement. I don't I don't agree with that at all. This team is clearly better than they were before. They're better coached. Uh, do they have better talent per se? That's a little bit arguable, but uh, I mean, 
you lost Brandon Marshall, and, and that sucked as far as production goes. And you you don't have a healthy Alshon Jeffrey, but you got rid of Brandon Marshall, who was a headache in the locker room. And and I think in the long term, that's that's going to be beneficial for you. Uh, your defense is is definitely better. Adrian Amos is better than any safety that they they trotted out on the field last year. Uh, Porter and Fuller are better than Porter and Jennings last year. The defensive line is Pernell McPhee is better than any any edge rusher that the Bears put out on the field last year. So, and they've and although they're they're not their defense isn't good, is think about the last two years is how many big plays the Bears gave up. They're not giving up those plays anymore. Sure, teams are marching down the field and and they're able to put up some points, but the Bears are making them work for it. And that's that's a sign of a well coached team. Is you know, you may not have the talent, but you're able to make that team earn every point that they get. They might score that touchdown, but it's not gonna be on a seventy yard bomb. It's gonna be on on a five yard run here and a six yard pass there and, and actually putting together a legitimate drive. You're really gonna make them earn it. Uh, as far as offense is the offense last year is, you know, you had Brandon Marshall and you had a healthy Alshon Jeffrey, uh, and for the most part you had most of the same key guys, but this year you have you have injuries up and down the wide receiver front, which makes it a much more difficult task to evaluate. And you lost or you sent Brandon Marshall away because of what a headache he is. So. I, I don't buy that that hypothesis that the Bears are no better off is you know ending the season last year and looking at what they needed versus what how much money they had to spend and how many draft picks they had. I, I sat down at the end of the season with a notepad and I, I probably have the notepad sitting around here somewhere with the same sheet. And I couldn't figure out for the life of me how the Bears were going to be able to put together a competitive team with how many holes they had and how much, how little cap room they had and how how few draft picks they had. And you have Ryan Pace. He did it. I mean, is it a Super Bowl team? Of course not. I mean, they, they are who the, what the record says they are. But... They've been a competitive team. They've had a couple of blowouts here and there. Uh, the Seattle game where they Jay Cutler didn't play and Alshon Jeffrey didn't play. Then that, that, that was to be expected. And they uh, they they got blown out by Arizona, which Arizona blows out a lot of teams. And you got blown out this game by uh by the Vikings, but other than that, was basically uh, the team giving up a little bit. But other than that, the Bears have been in a lot of games. I mean, think about a couple games where Robbie Gold missing kicks was what cost them the games. So they they've been in these games, and and it was large part due to a new coaching staff that actually knows how to coach, and Ryan Pace building the team smartly for the the long haul. He's not giving out these massive contracts to people. He's giving prove it deals to veterans, and he's wrote he's uh, churning the bottom of the roster to find guys that can play. Uh, so you're not just keeping a guy on the roster because you had him on your team and he knows your playbook. Is if guy can't play, you get rid of him. Uh, I mean, he's been doing that all season long, and uh, you know you. Uh, there's one thing. Uh, brings me to, I had a, an email question. Somebody asked why the Bears keep bringing in guys for for workouts but not signing them. And that was, uh, you know, that's a really good question. And, and that was one I probably didn't know the answer to two or three seasons ago. But uh, what happens is when you're an NFL team and you know you're going to have injuries, through the course of the season is you go to your backups. Backup takes the place of the starter that got hurt. And then you have to fill the role of the backup, which is use your third string. 
at some point you have to fill then you fill from your practice squad but at some point you have to fill in holes that you don't have a player for and as a as a gm what you have to do is is you have to have this database of guys that are available that you know what kind of shape they're in what kind of health they're in and and you've met with them before so you every week you're probably bringing in a handful of guys and giving them a workout and you keep them on your short list and it, and the issue is is when you get injuries is a lot of other teams are getting injuries as well and a lot of these guys are probably on several teams short list so that short list is once you have an injury you look to that short list and see if there's anybody on there that you're looking to bring up so if you run out of wide receivers you may have a you know undrafted rookie or a veteran that's currently you know coming back from an injury and hasn't signed with a team uh, you know Wes Welker was on a short list of somebody of the of the Rams they they needed a wide receiver and he was on their short list clearly I'm sure he was on a lot of teams short list and they ended up signing him and that's what happens is they're not they're not trying these guys out to be starters they're trying these guys out because they're last options they need they need a body that plays that position that can play in the NFL and is healthy so that's what they're doing there um anything else about the bears uh i, I mean my evaluation a couple weeks ago, I wrote up this evaluation of what I thought the Bears would do and wouldn't do in the offseason and who would they get rid of. And and I'm really starting to change my evaluation a little bit. Is I thought they might be fine on the offensive line because this offensive line has played well at times and Peronis Grasso is only going to get better. Uh, this The game's going to slow down for him. He's going to get stronger. Those are things that happen in the offseason. Uh, so I'm not that worried about it, but I mean, I th I'm starting to think now is you definitely need to upgrade that offensive line, and uh, you need you need to get better. You need to be consistently good and consistently opening up holes and consistent consistently keeping your quarterback clean. Uh, you're going to have to bring back Alshon Jeffrey because that he's been the cog that keeps your offense moving. Is regardless of what percentage of your yards are Matt Forte is Alshon Jeffrey when he's playing the Bears offense you know when he's playing healthy or at least somewhat healthy the Bears offense looks completely different than when he's out or he's playing hurt uh, so you've got to bring him back um, tight ends is you've got to figure out your tight end situation are you going to put up with Martellus Bennett being angry about his contract or are you going to sign him to a long-term deal? Or are you going to trade him away? What are you going to do with tight ends? Uh, the defensive line has been has hasn't been that good. You need them to be more stout in the run. You need them to uh, to be to be able to play better. They they have to be able to stop that run and and create some push on the pocket. Uh, you have to get more talent on the defensive line. You need an impact edge rusher who's going to be able to to get to the quarterback on those third mediums and third and longs to, to break it up. You need inside linebackers that have speed. There's not an inside linebacker the Bears have on their roster that is quality enough to be a starter in this league. And they need to improve. They need better speed and better play. Uh, I think they can be okay at cornerback. I mean, they'd like to see them add another one another cornerback but may not have to be a stud first rounder but i think adding another cornerback that has legitimate skill and some speed would be helpful and you need to upgrade over Przinski and antrell role is you need another safety that's an impact safety so the bears do have their their work cut out for them next year and i i think ryan pace is up for the challenge uh, you're going to have another year of your draft picks you're going to have kevin White, I mean, you're probably going to have what it seems like two top 10 draft picks because you're going to have Kevin White coming back and you're going to have whoever you draft this year. And right now the Bears are drafting, if the draft were today, would be drafting 10th. Um, 
So they've got two games left in the season. It would be nice for them to win at least one of them so they can finish with a better record than they did last year. So that's at least something positive to build off of is even if you're not feeling like it, you don't want to end the season with a seven-game losing streak. You've already got enough baggage with your terrible home record, your losing season, the amount of injuries you had, yada, yada, yada. You, you don't want to start, end the season on a seven-game losing streak, especially losing to the teams that you've lost to. Uh, so that's going to be it for for the, the Bears right now. And I'm going to quickly talk about the Bulls and the Blackhawks. And because I'm going to try to end on a positive note, I'm going to talk quickly about the Bulls. Uh, this Bulls team, it's they're not good. It's, they've got the talent. They've got, you know, they, they should on paper, they should be a pretty good team. They're deep. They can play small ball. They can play big ball. They just, you know, the, the, the players they have, the system they're trying to run, it's uh, it's just not working. I mean, Hoiberg wants a, a press offense where they push the ball up the court, and and he wants the ball, he wants less than five seconds in them to, to have the ball in offense and, and be pushing with the the ball handler. And instead, what they have is the point guard taking a sweet time come crossing the center line. You have Paul Gasol taking his time to get up there and then you have the last trailer man who comes and takes the ball and then tries to get an isolation play and that's what the Bulls do and it's not what the coach is trying to do Uh, you have Bobby Portis who should be playing more minutes but he can't get time because of the guys that are ahead of him you have Paul Gasol who's complaining Derek Rose I'm sure is complaining because he complains about everything Jimmy Butler's calling out his head coach in, in public it's it's a hot mess, and I was getting ready to talk about that. Maybe the Bulls turned a corner because they had they were coming off of four straight wins against the, the Clippers, New Orleans, Philadelphia, and Memphis, uh, and and then the wheels start coming off is because then you lose three games in a row. You lose to Detroit in quadruple overtime, which is you can't do you can't lose to Detroit at home Uh, then you go and get spanked by the Knicks in New York and then you lose to the lowly Brooklyn Nets that's got to be a wake-up call for you you've it's got to be a wake-up call for these players it's got to be a wake-up call for the coaching staff and it's got to be a wake-up call to guard and packs that this team as it is with this coaching staff is not going to win anything um you have, I mean, and you can't even blame it all on Hoiberg is because for the most part, this team is the same team as that you had last year. And it was a team that didn't want to play defense. And when you don't want to play defense for Tom Thibodeau, that says a lot about what your team is and the makeup of your team. Um, you know, on this team, you've got energy guys like Joe Keem and Bobby Portis, but you've got... Paul Gasol, who wants, who wants to play a set-up half-court offense. He doesn't want to run up and down the court. He doesn't want to expend a ton of energy playing defense. Um, Jimmy Butler, is, he's being paid like a number one, but he's not playing like a number one. I mean, you know, Jimmy Butler's calling out the head coach that needs to coach better. But you know what, Jimmy? You need to play better. Your defense has been terrible the last couple games, and you're not... You're not playing like a superstar. So maybe instead of calling out other people, you get a mirror and look at the guy in the mirror and say, hey, you need to friggin' play better. Is Jimmy Butler needs to pick it up. And Derrick Rose is Derrick Rose. He's uh, he's just a sad sack. He can't play like he used to. He's a broken down, young old man. And you've got a year and a half left of him on your team before you can jettison him because nobody wants that contract nobody's going to trade for him you're stuck with him you're stuck with him for the rest of this season and all of next season and he doesn't have what it takes to move the ball in Fred Poiberg's offense I mean he's 
partly because he's, fr he's stubborn and frustrating, and part of it is because he just doesn't have the skill to beat, you know, to be consistently good. Uh, I mean, every once in a while he can muster it up and, and show you flashes of, of the guy that won the MVP, but those plays are few and far between means before you see them. Uh, I don't know what the answer is, but this loss to Brooklyn Nets has got to be a wake-up call for you, especially since you've got a couple days off here, and then your next game is the Christmas Day game against Oklahoma City Thunder, and national audience. Are you going to go out there and get embarrassed by Oklahoma City? Yeah, I mean, that's... You're starting to get into a little bit of a hard part of your, your schedule. I mean, you're... Uh, your Bostons and your your Philadelphias and your Detroits and your Brooklyns are are out of the way, and you're you're losing to those guys, or barely scraping by to beat them, and now you're going to be starting to play some tougher teams. If you're the Bulls, you need you need to do some soul searching and uh, from every level, from player to management to coaching staff, is what what's going wrong and how do you fix it i as this team is built i don't see any way that they are going to make any noise in the playoffs i mean they'll make the playoffs because there's some bad teams out there but uh they're they're not going to make any noise they're not nearly good enough to beat any of the good teams in a series you know constructed as they are i mean especially considering that what the glue that seems to be holding putting this team together and making them a functional team is Mike Dunleavy. Uh, my, our friends over at, at Bow Podcast, uh, make sure you listen to them at B A W L. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. But you know, every time I talk to those guys, they, they want to hate on Mike Dunleavy, and I get it. Is he's He's not great at anything, but he's just a hard-nosed player that has learned how to play a decent team defense. He's big, he can shoot, he can score, he can rebound, and he does all those things because he's a hard-working, hard-trying guy. And he's been the cog that has put the Bulls together, and he's out with a, with a back injury. He should have been back by now, but he's had setbacks. And I'm not expecting him back probably till around March. Uh, I mean, I'm, I don't have any inside knowledge, but based on everything I've read, you know, I don't see him back before the All-Star All game. He's probably coming back like late February. And, and by that time, it's, you know, what, what's the Bulls going to look like? Uh, you know, he's, he, having him in there, it, it's going to help your rebounding, helps your overall team defense. He's a much more, I mean, he's not as good of a shooter as as McDermott, but he's a much more consistent shooter than McDermott, uh, and he's shown it over his career. He's a consistent scorer. He can, I mean, he's gone out there and guarded Carmelo. He's gone out there and, and scored against guys. He's, he's a guy that really can be the glue for this team. Uh, but... Like I said, he's out. You have to make do with what you have, and you, and you should still have a decent team because you've got Paul Gasol, you've got uh, Joe Kim Noah coming off the bench, you've got Jimmy Butler and and Derrick Rose, and and it's just not working. I mean, at this point, if you're the Bulls, you've got to start selling, and whether it be to clear salary cap to to rebuild or to build draft picks or addition by subtraction, whatever the case may be, is you need to start making moves because if this keeps going on the way it is, you're gonna have you're gonna have a coup on your hands and you're gonna have players revolting and not playing well and, and calling out guys in the media. Oh wait, that already happened. Um, it, it's, a, it's a sad situation for the Bulls and, and it's, I don't see it getting better anytime soon. You know, they might go on a winning streak here and there, but um, they. But it, it's not really going to mean anything because they're going to go on an equally long losing streak and and, and show, and show their merit there. 
and that's that's about all I have for the Bulls. Um, and, and last but not least, I want to talk about the Blackhawks, and this is going to be really brief. Uh, a because I'm exhausted and I'm I'm fighting a cold, and I have to be at work early tomorrow. I want to get this up still. Uh, but the Blackhawks are starting to round out into form. Um, we we talked about how they they were trying to figure out after uh, after the Duncan Keith injury they were they were really struggling to figure out you know who they were as far as playing defense they were trying to figure out line pairings they were only getting production from one line maybe one and a half lines but that's about it uh, and they they go out and they trade. Trevor Daly for for Rob Scuderi, and I made fun of the deal a lot because Rob Scuderi is he's basically a slower Michael Rosevall, <laughs> but but Trevor Daly was a big part of the problem. Is he was supposed to be like an offensive defenseman, but he for as fast as he was, he was always chasing somebody. He couldn't. He wasn't a good defend uh, defensive defenseman, and he wasn't scoring either. Uh, so it was. Trevor Daly was an issue. And Scuderi is more of a guy that Quenville trusts anyway. He's a veteran, uh, very predictable. That's a that's a Quenville guy. Um so you I mean you're and you switch up your your defensive pairings a little bit and, and suddenly you're starting to, to get better play. You've got Duncan Keith playing with Trevor Van Riemsdyk. Jalmerson playing with Seabrook and Scuderi and Rosaval is your third pairing, and 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 that's looking, that's looking the best that you've had your defense looking all season, which isn't amazing, but it's it's been much better than they have been, and you're starting to figure out a little bit of of your your lines. I mean, your your Kane, Anisimov, Panarin line is that's a that's your top line right now, and that's that's the line that's been the juggernaut. Is you know even even though Kane's streak ended, is he started a new streak, and you've got you've got them playing well. You move them to the first line. Uh, Marion Hosa is out with an upper body injury, and he's going to be out for a week or so. And you've lost a uh, Marcus Kruger. Jeez, I was old man moment. You lost Marcus Kruger uh, for you know. I'm, I'm reading multiple reports. I've read game to day to day, but I've uh, read that he could be gone for up to three to four months. So you've got Marcus Kruger that's out for a while, uh, but you're you're starting to figure out who your defensive or your offensive uh, lines are. So you move Jonathan Taves to the second line center, and now that Hose is hurt, you've got him play with Tavo Teravainen and Andrew Shaw. And Andrew Shaw is starting to figure out his game and, and getting him back into regular season form and, and looking like the guy that we've expected him to look like the last few seasons. Uh, but I, mean, I guess playing with Jonathan Taves and Tavo Teravainen is going to do that for you. Um, and then you have Dennis Rasmussen, who's been a big shock. Is is He's playing pretty well. And you've got him as your third line center with Brian Bickle and Brandon uh, Mashinter. And and then you sent Marco Dano down and brought up and with a Kruger's in, injury you have uh, Philip Deneau who you brought up and Philip Deneau if you watched the Rockford Ice Hogs games uh, he was really good last year and it was shocking to me that they never brought up Deneau to give him a chance but he was on what would be the the equivalent of the Anisimov Kane Panarin line for Rockford his line was the one that you always expected to score and did the best. Uh, and so you bring him up and he's starting to click really well with Andrew Desjardins and that fourth line is starting to do to do something so slowly but surely you're shaking off the rust you're figuring out who the guys you're going to keep up there are who the pairings are going to be who is the hot hand who's your defensive pairings and it's starting to round up into into form for the Blackhawks and it, you know I, I've, I've said this over and over is you know part of Part of the uh, the Stanley Cup hangover is that you've played a lot of hockey, and then you you know you have uh, you have salary cap issues, and and all of these things that that 
you know, create difficulty. And, and then you also have a team that, you know, plays a little lackadaisical in the regular season because the games don't mean as much, especially when you just won a Stanley Cup. But what happens is sometimes that uh, you keep thinking that you're going to throw on this second gear and make the playoffs and, and then be able to fly through the playoffs. And that's that's not really the case of what happens in the NHL. I mean, look at the Kings last year. Is they won the year before, and they last year it's they played with fire, played with fire, and they couldn't they couldn't figure out their their ailments and what was what was wrong with them. And then at the end of the year, they didn't even make the playoffs. Uh, whereas this year, if you look at the standings, they're they're a really good team. They're they got 42 points. So they're you know you're looking at they're they're the in first place in the Pacific. So it's it's not that they were a bad team. It was a uh, was just there was a lot of issues from playing a lot of hockey and and making some some roster moves and and the same things that the Blackhawks are going through now. Uh, but the Blackhawks luckily are starting to figure it out because you don't want to be at the end of the season struggling to get into the playoffs. Uh, having to rely on, I mean, this is a league where, uh, you know, you're not, it's not that everybody's straight up winning every night. It's, there's a lot of, of you know, two-point games where you're going into overtime and, and you're getting, somebody's getting a win, or three-point game, somebody's getting a win, getting the two points, but somebody's taking an overtime and getting one point. And, and in three-point games, uh, it's really hard to separate yourself. And at the end of the season, it's it's a lot difficult. It's a big task, and you're spending a lot of energy. And even if you do make the playoffs, it, it's tough to muster that that same fight throughout the playoffs. So the Blackhawks are actually finding themselves in a good position. They're in second place in all of uh, all of the Western Conference behind uh, the Dallas, who who they're playing uh, in the next couple days. They're playing um, Dallas uh, tomorrow night. 22nd, so they'll be seeing Johnny Oduya and, and Patrick Sharp. Uh, and so it's uh, it, it's nice to finally see them starting to come together and see a Chicago team start to look much better. Um, we'll have more next week because we'll have uh, the Carolina and the Dallas games under our belts and, and be able to see if this is sustained. But, I mean, as it stands right now is, uh, you know, after that bad loss to Nashville on, on earlier this month, you had back-to-back -back shutouts by Corey Crawford, uh, beating Winnipeg and Vancouver. Uh, the bad loss to Colorado, but then following it up with three straight wins, shutting out Edmonton, uh, beating Buffalo and Washington, San Jose, and, and shootout in overtime. So it's you're starting to see things click. And and one last thing is having Jonathan Tavis and Patrick Kane in on the same team on the same line in a in a three on three overtime is is pretty unfair to every team in the league because those two guys are good. And that's really all I have for you. I know I said I would talk baseball, but like I said, uh, the Bulls and the Bears really have me bummed out, uh, and I'm fighting a cold. If you can hear my voice, it's scratchy and sore, and I'm probably going to lose it for tomorrow. So I wanted to just kind of wrap this up. But thank you guys so much for listening and. As always, hit us up at Twitter at Swirsky Sports, Facebook.com slash Swirsky Sports, the website SwirskySports.com. Hit subscribe, whether you're watching on YouTube, Twitch, Stitcher, iTunes, however you're listening. Share it with friends, leave comments, send us questions. This is a by the fans, for the fans show. We like your feedback. So thank you guys so much for listening. Until next time, bear down. We thank Dick and God for all they have provided. Uh, 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 Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like... Remember, New Yorkers, smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31 to negative 7. The Bears! Oh, when the bears go bearing down.